Vaughn's Preface to the Rosicrucian Manifestos This is the preface written to the English translation of the Rosicrucian Manifestos, the fame and confession of the fraternity of R. C., commonly, of the Rosy Cross. With a preface annexed thereto, and a short declaration of their physical work. By Eugenius Philolethes London, J. M., for Giles Calvert. 1652 the preface. If it were the business of my life or learning, to procure myself that noise which men call fame, I am not to seek what might conduce to it. It is an age affords many advantages, and I might have the choice of several foundations, whereon to build myself. I can see withal, that time and employment have made some persons men, whom their first adventures did not find such. This sudden growth might give my imperfections also the confidence of such another start, but as I live not by common examples, so I drive not a common design. I have taken a course different from that of the world, for I would have you know, that whereas you plot to set yourselves up, I do here contrive to bring myself down. I am in the humor to affirm the essence and existence of that admired chimera, the fraternity of R.C. And now gentlemen I thank you. I have air and room enough. Methinks you sneak and steal from me, as if the plague and this red cross were inseparable. Take my lord have mercy along with you, for I pity your sickly brains, and certainly as to your present state the inscription is not unseasonable. But in lieu of this, some of you may advise me to an assertion of the Capriols of Del Fibo, or a review of the library of that discreet gentleman of the Mancha. For in your opinion those knights and these brothers are equally invisible. This is hard measure, but I shall not insist to disprove you. If there be any amongst the living of the same bookish faith with myself, they are the persons I would speak to, and yet in this I shall act modestly, I invite them not, unless they be at leisure. When I consider the unjust censure and indeed the contempt, which magic even in all ages hath undergone, I can find no other reasons for it. But what the professors themselves are guilty of by misconstruction, and this in reference to a double obscurity of life and language. As for their nice their conscientious retirements, whereby they did separate themselves from dissolute and brutish spirits, it is that which none can soberly discommend. Nay, it is a very purging argument, and may serve to wipe off those contracted, envious scandals, which time and man have injuriously fast ned on their memory. For if we reason discreetly, we may not safely trust the traditions and judgment of the world, concerning such persons who sequestered themselves from the world, and were no way addicted to the affairs or acquaintance thereof. It is true, they were losers by this alienation, for both their life and their principles were crossed to those of their adversaries. They lived in the shade, in the calm of conscience and solitude, but their enemies moved in the sunshine, in the eye of worldly transactions. Where they kept up their own repute with a clamorous defamation of these innocent and contented eremites. The second obstacle to their fame, was partly the simplicity of their style, which is scripture-like, and commonly begins like Solomon's text, with me filly. But that which spoiled all, and made them contemptible even to some degree of misery, was a corrupt delivery of the notions and vocabula of the art. For magic like the sun, moving from the east, carried along with it the oriental terms, which are western philosophers who skilled not the Arabic or Chalde, etc. did meet unhappily and corruptly transcribe, and verily at this day they are so strangely abused, it is more than a task to guess at their original. But this is not all, for some were so singular, as to invent certain barbarous terms of their own, and these conceited riddles together with their magisterial way of writing made the world conclude them a fabulous generation. Indeed this was a strange course of theirs, and much different from that of Trismegistus, in whose genuine works there is not one barbarous syllable, nor any point asserted. Without most pregnant and demonstrative reasons. Certainly Hermes as to his course of life was public and princely, in his doctrine clear and rational, and hence it was that not only his own times. But even all subsequent generations were most constant tributaries to his honor. 
On the contrary there succeeded him in his school certain melancholy envious spirits, whose obscure inscrutable writings rendered their authors contemptible. But made way for that new noise of Aristotle, which men call philosophy. I may say then of these later magicians what Salinas sometimes said of those contentious successors of Alexander the Great. That they were born, ad segetum Romani glorii, non ad hereditatum tanti nominis. It is equally true, that some skulking philosophers whiles they enviously suppressed the truth, did occasionally promote a lie. For they gave way to the enemy's growth, till at last the tares posseus the field, and then was the true grain cast into the fire. Nor indeed could it be otherwise, for this bushel being placed over the light, the darkness of it invited ignorance abroad. And now steps out Aristotle like a peddler with his pack, the triumphs of whose petulant school had but two weak supporters, obscurity and envy. Both these proceeded from the malignancy of some eminent authors, whom God had blessed with discoveries extraordinary. These to secure themselves in the art, judged it their best course to blot out the path, that such as were unworthy might never be able to follow them. It cannot be denied but this mystery and cloud of the letter carried with it both discretion and necessity, but what spoiled all was the excess of the contrivers. For they passed all decency both in the measure, and the manner of it. I could be numerous in examples, and proofs of this kind, but that I hold it superfluous to pause at a point which is acknowledged on all hands. To be short then, this umbrage and mist of their text required some comment and clearness, but few being able to expound, the world ran generally to the other side and the schoolmen have got the day. Not by weight but by number. This considered, it cannot be thought unreasonable and certainly not unseasonable, if a society conscious of the truth, and skilled in the abstruse principles of nature, shall endeavor to rectify the world, for hitherto we have been abused with Greek fables and a pretended knowledge of causes, but without their much desired effects. We plainly see, that if the least disease invades us, the schoolmen have not one notion, that is so much a charm, as to cure us. And why then should we embrace a philosophy of mere words, when it is evident enough, that we cannot live but by works? Let us not for shame be so stupid any more, for tis a barbarous ignorance to maintain that for truth which our own daily experience can assure us to be false. But some body will reply, that the antiquity of this parapatism may claim some reverence, and we must compliment ally invited abroad, not churlishly turn it out of doors. This in my opinion were to dance before Dagon, as David did before the ark, to pay that respect to a lie, which is due only to the truth, and this is answer sufficient. As for that fraternity, whose history and confession I have here adventured to publish, I have for my own part no relation to them, neither do I much desire their acquaintance. I know they are masters of great mysteries, and I know withal that nature is so large, they may as WEL receive as give. I was never yet so lavish an admirer of them, as to prefer them to all the world, for it is possible and perhaps true, that a private man may have that in his possession, whereof they are ignorant. It is not their title and the noise it hath occasioned, that makes me commend them. The acknowledgement I give them, was first procured by their books, for there I found them true philosophers, and therefore not chimeras but men. Their principles are every way correspondent to the ancient and primitive wisdom, nay, they are consonant to our very religion, and confirm every point thereof. I question not but most of their proposals may seem irregular to common capacities. But where the prerogative and power of nature is known, there will they quickly fall even, for they want not their order and sobriety. It will he expected perhaps, that I should speak something as to their persons and habitations, but in this my cold acquaintance will excuse me. Or had I any familiarity with them, I should not doubt to use it with more discretion. As for their existence, there is great reason we should believe it, neither do I see how we can deny it, unless we grant, that nature is studied. And books also written and published by some other creatures than men. It is true indeed, that their knowledge at first was not purchased by their own disquisitions, for they received it from the Arabians. 
amongst whom it remained as the monument and legacy of the children of the East. Nor is this at all improbable, for the Eastern countries have been always famous for magical and secret societies. Now am I to seek how far you will believe me in this, because I am a Christian, and yet I doubt not but you will believe a heathen, because Aristotle was one. Take them amongst you a more acceptable ethnic, I mean Philostratus, for thus he delivers himself in the life of Apollonius. He brings in his Tyaneus discoursing with Prince Freyotes, and amongst other questions proposed to the prince, Apollonius asks him, where he had learnt his philosophy, and the Greek tongue. For amongst the Indians there are no philosophers? To this simple query the prince replies, and with a notable sarcasm, etc. Our forefathers did ask all those who came hither in ships, if they were not pirates. For they conceived all the world addicted to that vice, though a great one, but you Grecians ask not those strangers who come to you, if they be philosophers. To this he adds a very dissolute opinion of the same Grecians, namely, that philosophy, which of all donatives is the divinest, should be esteemed amongst them as a thing indifferent. And proportionate to all capacities, and this, I am sure is a kind of piracy tolerated amongst you. Which being applied here to philosophy, I should make bold to render it sacrilege. But the prince proceeds, and schools his novice, for such was Apollonius, who was never acquainted with any one mystery of nature. I understand that amongst you Grecians there are many intruders, that unjustly apply themselves to philosophy, as being no way conformable to it. These usurp a profession which is not their own, as if they should first rob men of their clothes, and then wear them, though never so disproportionate. And thus do you proudly straddle in borrowed ornaments. And certainly, as pirates, who know themselves liable to innumerable tortures, do lead a sottish and a loose kind of life. Even so amongst you, these pirates and plunderers of philosophy are wholly given to lusts and competitions. And this I suppose is an evil that proceeds from the blindness and improvidence of your laws. For should any man-stealer be found amongst you, or should any adulterate your coin, these were offenses capital, and punished with death. But for such as counterfeit and corrupt philosophy, your law corrects them not, neither have you any magistrate ordained to that purpose. Thus we see in what respect the Greek sophistry was with the Indians, and that clamorous liberty they had to distract one another. Some of them being epicures, some cynics, some stoics, some again peripatetics, and some of them pretended platonics. It is not to be doubted, but the scuffling and squabbling of these sectaries did at last produce the skeptic, who finding not in the schools but opposition and bitterness, resolved for a new course. And secured his peace with his ignorance. Freyotes having thus returned that calumny, which Apollonius bestowed on the Indians, to the bosom of this conceited Greek, gives him now an account of his own college, I mean the Brachmans. With the excellent and wholesome severity of their discipline, and here I cannot but observe the insolence of Tyaneus, who being a mere stranger in the Indies, notwithstanding runs into a positive absurdity, and before he had conversed with the inhabitants, concludes them no philosophers. These bad manners of his I could derive from the customary arrogance of his countrymen, whose kindness to their own issue distinguished not the Greeks and the sages. But the rest of the world they discriminated with a certain sheep mark of their own, and branded them with the name of barbarians. How much an aspersion this is, we shall quickly understand, if we attend the prince in his discourse, for thus he instructs Apollonius. Amongst us Indians there are but few admitted to philosophy, and this is the manner of their election. At the age of eighteen years the person to be elected comes to the river Hyphasis, and there meets with those wise men, for whose sake even you also Apollonius are come into these parts. There he doth publicly profess a very ardent desire and affection to philosophy, for such as are otherwise disposed, are left to their own liberty, to follow what profession they please. This done, the next consideration is, whether he be descended of honest parents or no. And here they look back even to three generations, that by the disposition and qualities of the ancestors, they may guess at those of the child. If they find them to have been men of a known integrity, then they proceed to his admission, 
but first they try him, and prove him with several temptations. For example, whether he be naturally modest, or rather acts a counterfeit bashfulness for a time, being otherwise impudent and lascivious, whether he be sottish and gluttonous, or no. Whether he be of an insolent bold spirit, and may prove refractory, and disobedient to his tutors? Now those that are appointed to examine him, have the skill to read his qualities in his countenance. For the eyes discover most of men's manners, and in the brows and cheeks there are many excellent indicia, whereby wise men, and such as are skilled in the mysteries of nature, may discover our minds and dispositions, as images are discovered in a glass. And certainly since philosophy amongst the Indians is had in very great honor, it is necessary that those who would know the secrets of it, should be tempted and proved by all possible trials, before ever they be admitted. This was then the discipline of the Brachmans, and indeed of all the Magi in the election and proof of their pupils. But all this was news to Apollonius, and therefore he asks Freyotes, if these wise men, mentioned in his discourse, were of the same order with those, who did sometimes meet Alexander the Great, and had some conference with him, concerning heaven, for it seems they were astrologers. To this the prince answers, that these planet mongers were the, who were a people disposed to the wars. And for knowledge they make a great profession of it, but indeed they know nothing that is excellent. But he proceeds, etc. Those wise men who are truly such, dwell between the river Hyphasis and Ganges, into which place Alexander never came, not that he durst not attempt it. But as I think the reverence due to their mysteries kept him off. To this he adds, that Alexander knew the river Hyphasis was passable, and that he might with ease beleaguer the city, wherein these magi did dwell. But their tower had he brought with him a thousand such soldiers as Achilles was, and three thousand such as Ajax, he could never have taken it. To this he gives his reason, namely, that the magi did not make any sallies to beat off their enemies, but keeping quietly within their gates, they destroyed them with thunder and lightning. Here was a story might have startled Apollonius, who knew not the power of gunpowder, but in these our days there is nothing more familiar and credible. But notwithstanding the improvements of this fatal invention are not known even to the present generations, for the pyrography of Cornelius Agrippa and the powder of Friar Bacon were never yet brought to the field. And now let us hear the friar himself, who discoursing of several wonderful experiments, tells us amongst the rest of a secret composition, which being formed into pills, or little balls, and then cast up into the air, would break out into thunders and lightnings, more violent and horrible than those of nature. Praetor vero haec sunt alia stipenda naturi, nam soni volu tenitris edi coruscations possent fieri in air, immo majori horror quam illa qua fiant, per naturum. Nam modica materia adaptata, silicet ad quantitatum unius policis, sonum facet horribilin, ed coruscationum ostendit vehementum, ad hoc fit multis modis, Cabus civitis, aut exorcitis destruitor. Mira sunt haec, si ca siret uti ad plenum in debita quantitate et materia. Thus he. But let us return to Apollonius, for now he trots like a novice to the river Hyphasis, and carries with him a commendatory letter to the Brachmans. Having requested the prince to tell them he was a good boy. Here these admirable eastern magicians present him with such rarities as in very truth he was not capable of. First of all they shew him a certain azure, or sky-colored water, and this tincture was extremely predominant in it, but with much light and brightness. This strange liquor attracted the beams or splendor to itself, and did sink downwards, as if coagulated with the heat, but reflected to the eyes of the beholders a most beautiful rainbow. Here we have a perfect description of the philosopher's mercury, but there is something more behind. Apollonius confesseth how the Brachmans told him afterwards, that this water was, a certain secret water, and that there was hid under it, or within it, a blood-red earth. In a word, they told him that none might drink or taste of that liquor, neither was it drawn at all for any ordinary uses after this most mysterious water. They shew him also a certain mysterious fire, 
and here for my part one do not intend to comment. From this fire he is brought to certain tubs, or some such vessels, whereof the one was called the vessel of rain, and the other the vessel of winds, all which are most deep and excellent allegories. But these rarities imply no more than the rudiments of magic. Let us now come to the medicine itself, and the admirable effects thereof. The Brachmans anointed their heads, with a gummy medicine, and this made their bodies to steam at the pores, and sweat in that abundance. As if they had purged themselves with fire. This is enough to prove them philosophers. And now let us see what kind of habitation they had, and how much a parallel it is to that place or dwelling of our, sea, which his followers call Locus S. Spiritus. The wise men dwelt on a little hill, or mount, and on the hill there rested always a cloud, in which the Indians housed themselves, for so the word signifies. And here did they render themselves visible or invisible, at their own will and discretion. This secret of invisibility was not known to the Dutch Boer, nor to his plagiary, the author of the manna, but the fraternity of our, sea can move in this white mist. Ut nobiscum autumn convenius necess est hank lusum cernas, sign enim hac lus, impossible est nos vidir, nisi quando volumus. But Tyanius tells us something more, namely, that the Brachmans themselves did not know whether this hill was compassed about with walls, or had any gates that did lead to it, or no. For the mist obstructed all discoveries. Consider what you read, for thus some body writes concerning the habitation of our, c, vidi aliquando olympicus domos, non procul a fluviolo e civitate nota, quas es, spiritus vocari imaginamur. Helican est de quo locker, aut biceps parnassus, in quo equus pegasus fontum apparut perennis aqui et huc stillentum, in quo diana se lavit, cui venus ut pedisequa, et saturnus ut antiambulo. Conjunguntur. Intelligenti nimium, in experto minimum hoc erit dictum. But to clear the prospect a little more, let us hear Apollonius in a certain speech of his to the Egyptians, describing this Elysium of the Brachmans. I have seen the Brachmans of India dwelling on the earth, and not on the earth, they were guarded without walls, and possessing nothing, they enjoyed all things. This is plain enough, and on this hill have I also a desire to live, if it were for no other reason, but what the sophists sometimes applied to the mountains. Hos primum sol salutat, ultimosque desert. Cos locum non amet, dies longiors habentem? But of this place I will not speak any more, lest the readers should be so mad, as to entertain a suspicion, that I am of the order. I shall now therefore proceed to the theory of the Brachmans, and this only so far as their history will give me leave. I find Jarchaz then seated in his throne, and about him the rest of his society, where having first placed Apollonius in the seat royal of Freyotes, Jarchaz welcomes him with this unconfined liberty. Propound what questions thou wilt, for thou art come to men that know all things. Here Tyanius puts in, and very wisely asks them, what principles the world was compounded of, to this the Brachmans reply, it was compounded of the elements. Is it made then of the four elements? No but of five. Here the Grecian is puzzled, for besides earth and water, air and fire, I know not anything, what then is this fifth substance? It is the ether, which is the element of spirits, for those creatures which draw in the air, are mortal, but those which draw in the ether, are immortal. And here I cannot but observe the gross ignorance of Apollonius, who being a profist Pythagorean, had never heard of the ether, that famous Pythagorean principle. But let us come to his second question, which of all others doth most betray his weakness and insufficiency. He requests Jarchaz to inform him, which of the elements was first made. To this absurdity the learned Brachman answers like himself, they were made all at once, and he gives this reason for it, because no living creature is generated, by piecemeals. This was a wholesome and a rational tenet, for the chaos was first made, and in that all the elements at one and the same instant, for the world was manifested, and brought out of the chaos. Like a chick out of an for example to this Apollonius replies like a pure sophister, and must I think then that the world is a living creature?
Yes verily, if you reason rightly, for it giveth life to all things. Shall we then call it a male, or a female creature? Both, said the wise Brackman. For the world being a compound of both faculties, supplies the office of father and mother in the generation of those things that have life. We are now come to Apollonius's last philosophical queer, and sorry I am that he had not the wit to propound either more or better questions, but we must take them as they are. He asks Jarchaz, whether the earth or the sea did exceed in quantity? To this the Indian replies, that if he only considered the Mediterranean, or some other particular channel, the earth without question did exceed. But if you speak, concerning humidity, or moisture in general, then verily the earth is much lesser than the water, for it is the water that bears up the earth. This indeed is sound reason, and conformable both to scripture and nature, for the very spirit that animates and supports the universe, hath his habitation in the water. And now I suppose it is apparent to the understanding readers that the Brachmans were not a fabulous, superstitious society, but men of a severe doctrine, whose principles were answerable to the very rigor of nature, and did not wanton beyond her law. I could wish Apollonius had been more able to deal with them, but so short was he of philosophy, that he knew not what to ask them, and that ample liberty which they gave him was all of it to no purpose. This is clear to such as know anything out of his former queries, which we have already mentioned. But if we look on the rest of his problems, they are most of them but so many historical fables, which he brought with him out of Greece, and now he begins to shake his budget. The first thing comes out, is the, a monster, which man-devil could never meet withal. And then he questions Jarchaz, concerning a certain water of the color of gold, and this indeed might signify something but that he understood it literally, of common. Ordinary wellsprings, and therefore Jarchaz tells him, that he never heard of his Martikara, neither was it ever known, that any fountains of golden waters did spring in India. But this is not all, in the rear of this strange beast marched the pygmies, the cyapodes, and the macrocephaly, to which might be added all the animals in Lucian's history. But as we commonly say, that there is no smoke without some fire, so amongst those foreign fables came in some Indian allegories, and probably the Brachmans themselves had given then out. At once to declare and obscure their knowledge. These allegories are but two, and Jarchaz insists much upon them, besides a solemn acknowledgement, there is no reason but we should believe there are such things. The first of these two mysteries is the Pantarva, which Ficinus corruptly transcribes Pantora, and of this Apollonius desired to know the truth. Namely, if there was such a stone at all, and whether it was enriched with so strange a magnetism, as to attract to itself all other precious stones? This question the Brachman satisfies experimentally, for he had this goodly stone about him, and favored Apollonius with the sight thereof. But for our better information, let us hear Jarchas himself describe it, for he doth it so fully, that a very ordinary capacity may go along with him. This stone is generated in certain earthy caverns, some four yards deep, and hath in it such abundance of spirit, that in the place of its conception, the earth swells up, and at last breaks with the very tumor. But to look out this stone, belongs not to every body, for it vanisheth away, unless it be extracted with all possible caution. Only we that are Brachmans, by certain practices of our own, can find out the Pantarva. These are the words of Jarchaz, where you shall observe, that he hath confounded the first and second generation of the stone. It being the custom of the philosophers never to express their mysteries distinctly. The second birth then he hath fully and clearly discovered, for when the philosopher's first earth is moistened with its own milk, it swells, being impregnated with frequent imbibitions till at last it breaks, and with a soft heat sublimes. And then ascends the heavenly sulphur, being freed from his hell, for it leaves behind the binarius, or terra damata, and is no more a prisoner to that dross. This first heavenly sulphur is commonly called Petra Stellata, Edi Terra Margariterum, but Raymond Lully calls it Teram Terra, and in a certain place he describes it thus. Hac est tinctura quae avili terra e spoliat, 
etialia multum nobili reindut se. But elsewhere prescribing some caveats for the Rorid work, he expressly mentions the first and second sulfurs, commonly called sulfura de sulfuribus. Hoc intelligitur de terra, qua non est separata a vase, de terra terra. This is enough to prove the affinity of the Pantarva, and the philosopher's stone. Let us now return to Jeroha's, for he proceeds in his instructions, and Apollonius hears him to no purpose. The Pantarva after night discovers a fire as bright as day, for it is fiery and shining, but if you look on it in the daytime, it dazzles the eye with certain gleams or coruscations. Whence this light came, and what it was, the Brachman was not ignorant of, that light which shines in it, is a spirit of admirable power. For it attracts to itself all things that are near it. And here he tells Tiamius, that if precious stones were cast into the sea, or into some river, and this too confusedly, as being far scattered and dispersed one from another. Yet this magical stone being let down after then, would bring them again together, for they would all move towards the Pantarva, and cluster under it, like a swarm of bees. This is all he tells him, but in conclusion he protesteth his Pantarva, in plain terms he shewed him the philosopher's stone, and the miraculous effects thereof. The second secret which Apollonius stumbled on, for he knew it not as a secret, was the gold of the griffins, and this also Jarchas doth acknowledge, but I shall forbear to speak of it. For I hold it not altogether convenient. It is time now to dismiss Apollonius, and his Brachmans, and this I will do, but I shall first prevent an objection, though a sorry one, for ignorance makes use of all tools. It will be said perhaps, I have been too bold with Apollonius, who, in the opinion of many men, and such as would be thought learned, was a very great philosopher. To this I answer, that I question not any man's learning, let them think of themselves as they please. And if they can, let them be answerable to their thoughts. But as for Apollonius, I say, the noise of his miracles, like those of Xavier, may fill some credulous ears, and this sudden larum may procure him entertainment. But had these admirers perused his history, they had not betrayed so much weakness, as to allow him any sober character. It is true, Philostratus attributes many strange performances to him, as that he should raise the dead, free himself from prison, and shake off his chains, with as much divinity as S. Peter himself. Nay, that pleading with Domitian in a full senate, he should suddenly vanish away, and be translated in a moment from Rome to Putiali. Truly these are great effects, but if we consider only what Philostratus himself will confess, we shall quickly find that all these things are but his inventions. For in the beginning of his romance, where he would give his readers an account of his materials, and from what hands he received them, he tells us, that Damis, who was Apollonius his fellow traveler, did write his life, and all the occurrences thereof. But these commentaries of Damis were never published by Damis himself, only a friend of his, a somebody. A certain familiar of Damis did communicate them to Julia the Queen. And here Philostratus tells me, that this queen commanded him to transcribe these commentaries. It seems then they were originally written in the Greek, and Philostratus is a mere transcribler, and no author. This I cannot believe, for Damis was an Assyrian, and, as he himself confesseth, a very ignorant person, and altogether illiterate. But meeting with Apollonius, and conversing with the Greeks, he also was almost made a Grecian, but not altogether, not so learned a Grecian as to write histories. And in a style like that of Philostratus. But this is not all, our author tells us of one Marigenes, who had formerly written the life of Apollonius in four books. But this fellow was ignorant of the performances or miracles of Tyanius. And what follows this ignorance? We must not therefore believe Marigenes. And why not I beseech you? Because forsooth he lived near, if not in the days of Apollonius, but never heard of those monstrous fables which Philostratus afterwards invented. We must then believe Philostratus himself, for he is the, not the familiar friend, but the familiar spirit of Apollonius. It was he indeed that wrought all these wonders, for Apollonius himself never wrought any. 
Now for the learning of this Tyaneus I must confess for my part one cannot find it. The philosophy that he pretended to, was that of Pythagoras, for thus he rants it to Vardanes the Babylonian. Etc. I am a master of the wisdom of Pythagoras the Samian, he taught me the true form of worshipping the gods, and who of them are visible, who invisible. And how I may come to speak with them. How true this is, we may easily know, if we look back on his education. His tutor in the Pythagorean principles was one Euxenus, a notable sot, and a mere ignorant, as Philostratus tells us. He was an epicure in his course of life. And for his learning, he could only repeat some sentences of Pythagoras, but did not understand them. And therefore he compares him to certain mimic birds, who are taught there, and there, but know not what the words signify. Now what instructions he was like to receive from this man, let any indifferent reader judge. But we have something more to say, for if Apollonius when he was at Babylon, could converse with the gods, why did he afterwards desire to be taught of men? For when he comes to India, he requests the Brachmans to teach him the art of divination. Certainly, had he been familiar with angels and spirits, he had not troubled them with such a question. These indeed are the slips of Philostratus, who had the art of lying, but wanted the art of memory. In another place he tells us, that Apollonius understood, all the languages that men did speak, and which is more miraculous, even their secret cogitations. This is much indeed, but shortly afterwards he forgets these strange perfections, for when he brings him to Freyotes, that serious eastern prince, there doth he use an interpreter. For Tyaneus, who formerly understood all languages, could not understand the language of the prince. And so far was he from knowing his secret thoughts, that he did not know in how many languages he could express those thoughts. For when the prince was pleased to express himself in the Greek tongue, Tyaneus was quite dejected, and did much wonder how he came to be a master of that dialect. Now if any man will say, that the Brachmans did impart their mysteries to him, it is apparent enough they did not. This is it which even Damis tells us, for Apollonius requested nothing of the Brachmans, but certain divinatory tricks, by which he might foretell things to come. And here Jarchas takes occasion to discourse with him about revelations, for he speaks not of any prognosticating knacks, which this Greek did look after. He tells him then, that he judged him a most happy man, who could obtain any foreknowledge at the hands of God, and preach that to the ignorant, which he did already foresee. As for rules to divine by, he prescribes not any, for it was too gross an error for such a philosopher as himself. He only tells him, that he should lead a pure life, and keep himself spotless from the flesh. One passage indeed there is, which I cannot omit, Jarchas informs Apollonius, that of all gifts imparted to man by revelation, the chiefest is the gift of healing or medicine. But this heavenly, and most beneficial truth, Apollonius was not sensible of, for he was so great a stranger to the secrets of nature, that he did not know what to ask for. For my own part, if I durst think him a philosopher, should seat him with the Stoics, for he was a great master of moral seventies, and this is all the character I can give him. As for Philostratus, if we were not even with him, I should think he had much abused us, for when he penned his history, he allowed us no discretion, who were to come after him. I could be sorry for some absurdities he hath fastened on Jarchas, did not the principles of that glorious Brachman refute them. What they are, I shall not tell you, for I am confined to a preface, and cannot proportion my discourse to the deserts of my subject. And here some critic may drop his discipline, and bid me face about, for I am wide of my text, the society of R. C. I have indeed exceeded in my service to the Brachmans. But in all that there was no impertinency. I did it, to shew the conformity of the old and new professors, and this is so far from digression, I can think it near a demonstration. For when we have evidence that magicians have been, it is proof also that they may be, since it cannot be denied, but precedents exclude impossibility. I hold it then worth our observation, that even those magi, who came to Christ himself, came from the East, but as we cannot prove they were Brachmans, so neither can we prove they were not. 
Now if any man will he so cross, as to contend for the negative, he shall have my thanks for the advantage he allows me. For then it must follow, that the East afforded more magical societies than one. But this point I need not insist on, for the learned will not deny, but wisdom and light were first manifested in the same parts, namely, in the East, where the first man planted. And hence did the world receive not only their religion, but their philosophy, for custom hath distinguished those two. From this fountain also, this living, oriental one, did the brothers of our, sea, draw their wholesome waters. For their founder received his principles at Damkar in Arabia, as their fama will instruct you at large. It was not amiss then, if I spent my hour in that bright region, and paid a weak gratitude to those primitive benefactors, for tis a law with me, ca aquam horis, putium corona. But that I may come at last to the subject intended, I shall confess for my part, I have no acquaintance with this fraternity as to their persons, but their doctrine I am not so much a stranger to. And here, for the reader's satisfaction, I shall speak something of it, not that I would discover or point at any particulars. For that's a kindness which they have not for any man, nisi absumpto solus modia, till they first eat a bushel of salt with him. They tell us then, that the fire and spirit of God did work upon the earth and the water. And out of them, did the spirit extract a pure clear substance, which they call the terrestrial heaven, in this heaven the spirit seated himself, impressing his image therein. And out of this heavenly clarified extract, impregnated with the influx and image of the spirit, was formed that most noble creature, whom we call man. This first matter of man was a liquid transparent salt, a certain bright earth, purified by a supernatural agent. And tempered with a strange unctuous humidity, enlightened with all the tinctures of the sun and stars. It was and is the manera of all creatures, and this society doth acknowledge it to be their very basis, and the first gate that leads to all their secrets. This earth or water naturally produceth their agent, but it comes not to their hands without art. By their agent I understand their fire, commonly called Mos Aqui, Vulcanus, Sol Invisibilis, Filius Solis, Astrum Inferius, Faber Occultus, Intrinsecus, with a thousand other names. It is sans all metaphors and that I may speak truth even in the phrase of Aristotle, it is this is that fire which Zoroaster calls. In plain terms, it is the tincture of the matrix, a fiery, radiant soul, that calls up another soul like itself. For it awakes the anima of the mercury, which is almost drowned in a cold and phlegmatic lethe. And here reader, let it he thy endeavor to understand the philosophers, for they tell us, that God at first created the chaos, and afterwards divided it into three portions. Of the first he made the spiritual world, of the second the visible heavens, and their lights, but the third and worst part was appointed for this sublunary building. Out of this course and remaining portion he extracted the elemental quintessence, or first matter of all earthly things, and of this the four elements were made. Now reader guess, if thou dost know the matter, for it may be thou art one of those who conceive themselves to be somebody. I tell thee this theory is Raymond Lully's, and if thou canst make nothing of it, I can without a figure tell thee how wise thou art. There are in the world as many sorts of salts, as there are species, and the salts differ as the species do, namely, essentially, for the specific forms lie in the salt. Now learn of me that there is no true physic, but what is in salt. For salt was never known to putrefy, nay it hinders putrefaction and corruption in all things, and what hinders corruption, hinders all diseases. Now it is evident to all the world, that salt hinders corruption, and a solution of the parts, and this not only in living things, but even in dead bodies. For if they be seasoned with salt, then are they preserved, and corruption comes not at them. It is to be observed, that Virgil in the cure of Aeneas brings in his mother Venus with a panacea, or an universal medicine. Occult medicans, spargit salubras. Ambrosia sucos, eti odoriferum panaceum. This word is much abused by certain alchemists, as they call themselves, but Servius upon the place telephones us, 
it is Nomen Meyer Compositum, and he observes out of Lucretius, that the panacea was salt. It is true, that if we could putrefy salt, it would discover all the mysteries of nature, for it hath all the tinctures in it. But to destroy this substance, is a hard task, for he that would do it, must do something more, than death can do, for even her prerogative comes not so far. Moreover it cannot be denied, but some wise men have attained to the putrefaction of salts, but this key they received from God, and it is the great secret of their art. What I admire most in it, is this, that when it is killed, it dies not, but recovers to a better life, which is a very strange privilege. On the contrary, if some animal dies, if an herb withers, or if some metal be calcined and the parts thereof truly separated, we can never restore them again. But this mystical substance, this root of the world, if you bring his parts together, after they are separated, then will not he be quiet, but run from one complexion to another. From this color to that, as from green to red, from red to black, from black to a million of colors, and these miraculous alterations will not cease, till he hath worked out his own resurrection. And hath clearly brought himself to a supernatural temperature. I say then that salt is the true grain, the seed not only of this world, but of the next, and it is the mystery that God hath made. It is a living water, wherein there dwells a divine fire, and this fire binds the parts thereof to himself, coagulates them, and stops their flux, and salt is the water, that wets not the hand. This fire is the life, and therefore it hinders death, nay it is such a preservative against it, that the very gross body of salt prevents corruption, wheresoever it comes. But if any man would fully know the power of this fire, let him wisely and effectually dislodge him, let him destroy his habitation, and then he shall see, what course this artist will take. To repair his own house. Do not think now that I speak of common salts, though I confess they are great medicines, if rightly prepared. I told thee formerly, there were several sorts of salts, and here I would have thee study lest thy labors should end with that complaint of the chemist in Sendivogus. Lapidem amisum deplorabat, edi maxime condolbat, quat saturnum non interrogavrit, quali sal hoc furit, cum tor varia genera salium repiriantur. I shall advise thee then to consider the several divisions of the chaos, which I have formerly mentioned out of Raymond Lully, for the matter as it is there described is not subject to many complexions, and therefore thy mistakes cannot be many. And now let us touch at the treasures of our saltish liquor, and our liquid salt. Veniamus quiso ad illum spiritus, seu aqui gratum, canobis sensibilior, magisque familiaris est. Naturoc area vestigia diligenti inquisition scrutimer, incuius occulto mirabilia delightscant. Videlicet, angeli onium gene rum, Forma rerum inferiorum essentifici, humidum radical quiusque viventus, ignis spici nutrimentum, admirabiles meteororum apparitions. Ventorum quiusque anguli violenti eruptions, et infinita alia mysteria. And now perhaps thou dost begin to bless thyself, for is it possible that any bodily substance should enclose such mysteries as these? In this, my friend, thou has thy liberty, trouble not thyself about it, for thy faith will add nothing to it, and thy incredulity cannot take anything from it. This only thou shalt do, be pleased to give way to my sauciness, for I must tell thee, I do not know that thing, which I may call impossible. I am sure there are in nature powers of all sorts, and answerable to all desires, and even those very powers are subject to us. Behold, I will declare unto thee their generation, and their secret descents even to this earth. It is most certain that God works by the ideas of his own mind, and the ideas dispense their seals, and communicate them daily to the matter. Now the anima mundi hath in the fixed stars, her particular forms, or seminal conceptions answerable to the ideas of the divine mind. And here doth she first receive those spiritual powers and influences, which originally proceed from God. From this place they are conveyed to the planets, especially to the sun and moon, and these two great lights impart them to the air. And from the air they pass down to the belly or matrix of the earth in prolific, 
spirited winds and waters. Seeing then that the visible heavens receive the brightness of the spiritual world, and this earth the brightness of the visible heavens, why may not we find something on earth? Which takes in this brightness, and comprehends in itself the powers of the two superior worlds. Now if there he such a subject to he found, I suppose it will not be denied, but the powers of the angelical and celestial worlds are very strange powers, and what that is which they cannot do is hard to determine. The subject then is the salt I have spoken of formerly, it is the body of the universal spirit. It is the sperm of nature, which she prepares for her own light, as if we should prepare oil for a lamp. A strange substance it is, but very common, and of some philosophers most properly called, Selina Virens, E.T. Mirabilis. And here it will not be amiss to speak something of the Kabbalists' linea voridis, or green line, a mystery not rightly apprehended even by some of the Macubalim. But certainly the modern rabbins know it not at all. It is the last mitta or propriety of the Sephiroths, for it receives and includes all the influences of the spheristical order. It compasseth the heavens, and in them the earth, like a green rainbow, or one vast sphere of viridity. And from this viridity the divine influences are shored down like rain through the ether into the globes of the fixed stars. For what the air is to the globe of the earth, such is the ether to the globes of the stars, and here lies a secret of the Macubalim, for they tell us, there is a double Venus, in duplice air. But of this enough. I will now speak of the philosopher's secret, and blessed viridity, which is to he seen and felt here below. It is the produce of the old poets, for if the spirit of this green gold be at liberty, which will not be till the body is bound, then will he discover all the essences of the universal center. Tum veri eludent species, at ora ferrarum. Fiat enim subito sus horridus, attract tigris. Squamasusc draco, e salva servis liena. Aut acrem flamis sonatum dabit, at gita vinclis. Exodet, aut in aquas tenues delapsis ababit. Omnia transformat sisi in miracula rerum. Ignem corribulemc ferum, fluvium cliquentum. But this is poetry, let us now hear the same scene described by a most excellent, and withal a severe professor of philosophy. Ubi vera spiritus excessit e fragilibus, per quos sparsus erat, miatibus, est ke abami prorsum caluvi purgatus, in infinitas sisi adlet formas. Modo in herbam, modo in lapidem, aut in insolidum quadum animal, interdum in aquor, aut unionum, aut gemum, aut metalum. Dulce ke rubentibus I am flamis emicans, in multa statum calorum myriadus transit, vivit portentorum semper effector, ac magus, isto nequaquin fetissens labor. Said vigor ac viribus indis adolescens. Thus he, and now reader I must tell thee, that all these miracles grow out of a certain earth, a soft red clay, which is to be found everywhere. It may be thou art much troubled at these appearances which I have mentioned, but what wilt thou say to Iamblichus, who tells us seriously, that this earth will attract angels, I mean good spirits? For so did he. But let us hear this auditor of Anibo, for thus he writes from Egypt to Porphyrius. Omnium prima et antiquissima entia, in ultimis quoque sti brutalent, immaterialiac principia materialibus et sunt. Nemo attack meriter, si quam mater I am esse disius purum, ac divinum. Nam ipsa quoque materia, quum abapophis, patrec omnium factus sit, merito perfectionum sue quandam acquisivit, aptum ad deos sicipiendos. Quinitium quum nihil prohibit superiora lumen sum ad inferiora defundra, nec igitur mater I am permittent expertum for superiorum. Qua propter quantum cunc materia perfectum, in purum est, at deiform, ad deorum susceptionum non est ineptum. Nam quum operturit idium terrina nullo modo divini communionis expertia for, ipsa quoque terra divinum quandam portionum suspit, ad copiendos deo sufficientum. Non ergo fas est omnum, mater I am detestari, sed solum, qua dies furit aliena. 
Proprium vero ad illos decit eligir, ut pot qua cons entire posset. Nic enim aliter terrenis loci's, idi hominibus hic habitantibus, possessio, portio vola ex divinis contingera potest, nisi tail quid dam prius i actum furit fundamentum. Arcanis attack sermonibus credendum est, testantibus ad deus per beata spectacula, tradidum fuis materium quandum, Haec ergo illus ipsis tridentibus cognata est talus ergo materia deos excitat. Utse demons Trent, etc. These are the words of Iamblichus, in that profound discourse of his, where he gives Porphyrius an account of the Egyptian, Chaldean, and Assyrian mysteries. I know the philosophical earth discovers not those forms I have spoken of in the common, ordinary process, which if any man knows, I shall not therefore call him a philosopher. There are several ways to use this mystery, both first and last, and some of them may be communicated, but some not. To conclude, I say, that this clarified earth is the stage of all forms, for here they are manifested like images in a glass. And when the time of their manifestation is finished, they retreat into that center, out of which at first they came. Hence came all vegetables, all minerals, and all the animals in the world, even man himself with all his tumult and principality. This soft clay is the mother of them all, and what the divine Virgil sometimes said of Italy, may be very properly applied to this our Saturnine and sovereign earth. Hake dedit argenti rivos, erisc metalla. Astendit venus, at oro plurima fluxit. Hake genus acre virum, marsos, pubemc sabellum. Aswatumc malo ligurum, Volskosk Verudos. Extulit, Haec Decios, Marios, Magnos Camillos. Salve Magna Parens Frugum, Satenia Tellus, Magna Virum. Thus reader have I endeavored to produce some reasons for those strange effects, whereof this society hath made a public profession. I did it not as a kindness to them, for I pen no plots, neither do I desire their familiarity. I am indeed of the same faith with them, and I have thus prefact, because I had the impudence to think it concerned me as much as them. And verily it is true, that wheresoever I meet my own positions, there have I an interest, and I am as much bound to the defense of that author, as I am to my own. Now for the ground here laid, it is the art of water, the philosopher's clavis humida, and this society's paragon. I dare not speak anything of their metaphysical mystery, but I can tell thee it is not the same with the philosopher's stone, either in form or matter, and let this satisfy thee. I know some dispositions are so crossed to these principles, I might write again to excuse what I have written, but this I am resolved not to do. If thou art a malicious reader, and dost think it too much, because it suits not with thy own jingles, I must tell thee, thou art none of my peers. For I have known some sciences which thou hast never heard of, nor thy fathers before thee. But to make an end, would have every man descend into himself, and rationally consider those generations which are obvious to our eyes. We see there is a power granted to man over those things, whose original he doth know. Examples and instances we have in corn, and other vegetables, whose seed being known to the husbandman, he can by the seed multiply his corn, and provide for himself, as he thinks fit. It is just so in minerals, there is a seed out of which nature makes them, a first matter. And this the magicians carefully sought after they reasoned with themselves, that as nature by the vegetable seed, did multiply vegetables, so might they also by the mineral seed, multiply minerals. When they had found out the seed, they practiced upon it several ways. They did shut it up in glasses, keeping it in a most equal tempered heat, for many months together, but all was to no purpose. Then did they fancy another course, for they buried it in the earth, and left it there for a long time, but without any success. At last they considered, God without all question being their guide, that nature had for every seed a vessel of her own, and that all her vessels were but several sorts of earth. For example, the vegetable seed had the common earth for his vessel, for therein nature did sow it. The animal sperm had the flesh for his, and flesh is but a soft animated earth, as it appears in the dissolution of the body. 
They saw plainly then, that both these vessels were not appointed for the mineral sperm, they were too cold for it, and common fire was too hot. Or if it were well regulated, yet could it not alter the sperm, for it had not the qualities of a matrix. Then did they try several new heats. They exposed their matter to the sun, they buried it in dunghills and beds of quicklime, they placed their glasses in the moonbeams, they invented new baths, they made use of sand, ashes, and filings of iron, they burnt oil, and fancied all sorts of lamps, but all this was error, and it ended in a troublesome nothing. Now all these falsities shall a man meet with in their books. For when they had found out the mineral vessel, and especially the second earth, wherein they sowed their mercury and sulfur, then did they so confound the work. That it is almost impossible to get the preparation out of their hands. This I thought fit to touch upon, that those difficulties, which great and aspiring wits must strive withal, may be the more apparent, and surely I think I have pretty well cleared the way. Thus reader have I given thee my best advice, and now it remains thou shouldst rail at me for it. It may be thou hast a free spirit, but if this liberality concerns not thy credit, keep thy spleen to thyself, for I would not have thee spend what thou canst well spare. Soli Deo Gloria. A short. Advertisement. To the reader. This advertisement, reader, invites thee not to my lodging, for I would give thee no such directions, my nature being more melancholy, than sociable. I would only tell thee how charitable I am, for having purposely omitted some necessaries in my former discourse, I have upon second thoughts resolved against that silence. There is abroad a bold ignorance, for philosophy hath her confidence, but in a sense different from the madam's. This generation I have sometimes met with all, and least they should ride, and repent, I thought it not amiss to shew them the precipices. The second philosophical work is commonly called the gross work, but it is one of the greatest subtleties in all the art. Cornelius Agrippa knew the first preparation, and hath clearly discovered it, but the difficulty of the second made him almost an enemy to his own profession. By the second work, I understand not coagulation, but the solution of the philosophical salt, a secret which Agrippa did not rightly know, as it appears by his practice at Moline. Nor would Natilius teach him, for all his frequent, and serious entreaties. This was it, that made his necessities so vigorous, and his purse so weak, that I can seldom find him in a full fortune. But in this, he is not alone, Raymond Lully the best Christian artist that ever was, received not this mystery from Arnoldus for in his first practices he followed the tedious common process. Which after all is scarce profitable. Here he met with a drudgery almost invincible, and if we add the task to the time, it is enough to make a man old. Norton was so strange an ignoramus in this point, that if the solution and purgation were performed in three years, he thought it a happy work. George Ripley labored for new inventions, to putrefy this red salt, which he enviously calories his gold. And his knack is, to expose it to alternate fits of cold and heat, but in this he is singular and Faber is so wise he will not understand him. And now that I have mentioned Faber, I must need say that Tubal Cain himself is short of the right solution, for the process he describes hath not anything of nature in it. Let us return then to Raymond Lully, for he was so great a master, that he performed the solution, Infra Novum dies, and this secret he had from God himself, for this is his confession. Nos de prima illa nigridine a pausis cognita, Benignum spiritum extrabir affectants, pugnam ignis vincentum, et non victim, licit sensibus corporis multides palpavimus. Eti oculis proprius illum vitimus, extractionis temen ipsius noticium non habimus quacunc scientiarum, vel arte. Ideoc sentiebimus nec ad hoc aliqua rusticitate excicados, quia nullo modo im comprehendera voluimus, donec alias spiritus perficii, spirens a pater luminum descendit. Tenquam suas nullitinus deserens, aut a se postulantibus deficiens, ca insomnius tantam claritatem mentis nostrae oculis infulsit, ut illum intus et extra, remota omni figura. Gratis revelar dignatus est, 
insatiabili bonitate nos reficiendo, demons trans ut ad em implendum disponerimus corpus ad unam naturalum decoctionum secretum. Qua penitus ordine retrogrado cum pungenti lancea, tota ius nature in merum nigridinum visibiliter dissolveriter. Here lies the knot, and who is he that will untie it? For saith the same lully, it was never put to paper, and he gives this reason for it. Kia solius de est ae revelar, et homo divini maestati subtrahir nititer, cum soli deo pertinentia vulgat spiritu prolationis humani, aut literarum siri. Propteria operationum illum habira non poteris, quusque spiritualiter prius furis divinitatis maritis comprobatis. Kia hoc secretum a nemini mortali revelandum est, praeterquam ab almo spiritu, ca ubi vult, spirit. It seems then the greatest difficulty is not in the coagulation or production of the philosophical salt, but in the putrefaction of it, when it is produced. Indeed this agrees best with the sense of the philosophers, for one of those preecisions telephones us, ca sit salem, adiaeus solutionum, sit secretum occultum antiquorum philosophorum. Alas then! What shall we do? Whence comes our next intelligence? I am afraid here is a sad truth for some body. Shall we run now to Lucas Rodargerus, or have we any dusty manuscripts, that can instruct us? Well reader, thou sayest how free I am grown, and now I could discover something else, but here is enough at once. I could indeed tell thee of the first and second sublimation, of a double nativity, visible and invisible, without which the matter is not alterable, as to our purpose. I could tell thee also of sulfur simple, and compounded, of three argents vive, and as many salts, and all this would be new news even to the best learned in England. But I have done, and I hope this discourse hath not demolished any man's castles, for why should they despair, when I contribute to their building? I am a hardy dispensero, and if they have got anything by me, much good may it do them. It is my onely fear, they will mistake when they read, for were I to live long, which I am confident I shall not, I would make no other wish, but that my years might be as many as their errors. I speak not this out of any contempt, for I undervalue no man. It is my experience in this kind of learning, which I ever made my business, that gives me the boldness to suspect a possibility of the same failings in others, which I have found in myself. To conclude I would have my reader know, that the philosophers finding this life subjected to necessity, and that necessity was inconsistent with the nature of the soul. They did therefore look upon man, as a creature originally ordained for some better state than the present, for this was not agreeable with his spirit. This thought made them seek the ground of his creation, that if possible, they might take hold of liberty, and transcend the dispensations of that circle, which they mysteriously called fate. Now what this really signifies not one in ten thousand knows, and yet we are all philosophers. But to come to my purpose, I say, the true philosophers did find in every compound a double complexion, circumferential, and central. The circumferential was corrupt in all things, but in some things altogether venomous. The central not so, for in the center of everything there was a perfect unity, a miraculous indissoluble concord of fire and water. These two complexions are the manifestum and the occultum of the Arabians, and they resist one another, for they are contraries. In the center itself they found no discords at all, for the difference of spirits consisted not in qualities, but in degrees of essence and transcendency. As for the water, it was of kin with the fire, for it was not common, but ethereal. In all centers this fire was not the same, for in some it was only a solar spirit, and such a center was called, aqua solis, aqua coalestis, aqua ori, et argenti. In some again the spirit was more than solar, for it was supercoelestial, and metaphysical. This spirit purged the very rational soul, and awakened her root that was asleep, and therefore such a center was called, aqua igni tincta, aqua serenans, candelas accendens, ed doma illuminans. Of both these waters have I discoursed in those small tractates I have published. And though I have had some dirt cast at me for my pains, yet this is so ordinary I mind it not, 
for whiles we live here we ride in a highway. I cannot think him wise who resents his injuries, for he sets a rate upon things that are worthless, and makes use of his spleen where his scorn becomes him. This is the entertainment I provide for my adversaries, and if they think it too coarse, let them judge where they understand, and they may fare better.